evening and welcome to the Thursday, September 26, 2019 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. I'm Mayor David Narkowitz, the chair. I'll begin the meeting by asking our clerk to call the roll of the school committee. Mayor David Narkowitz. Present. Ms. Molly Burnham. Present. Uh, Ms. Laura Fallon. Present. Ms. Ann Hennessy. Present. Mr. Lonnie Coffin. Present. Mr. Downey Meyer. Here. Mr. Howard Moore. Here. Ms. Susan Voss. Present. Mr. Ed Zahowski. Present. Your Honor, you have a quorum. Thank you very much. And just letting the public know that this meeting is being audio and video recorded by our friends at Northampton Open Media. I uh, have to get the new name in there. They've, they've had a name change. Um, so um, is there anyone from the public who wishes to speak during the public comment period? We had no one signed up, but I just want to make the offer. Going once, going twice, okay. So there's no public comment this evening. How about announcements from the school committee? Any announcements? Okay. Yes. Oh, sorry, Mr. Kaufman, I apologize. No problem, thank you. Um, I just want to say a few things that um, I think we're all aware of is that we received information recently about the Student Opportunity Act that um, is now being debated. And uh, yesterday, some of us, uh, I'm not actually sure who, but I know at least three of us, I heard <laughs> names participated in Senator, Senator Comerford's um, uh, voice conference. And I just wanted to highlight a few of the things she said that I heard, and please, anybody else that was available, add in or correct me if I'm wrong. But um, I think um, the things that I was most impressed with is that Senator Comerford was very honest about the amount of work that went into this and really acknowledged some local people uh, from Hampshire County and Franklin <coughs> County who advocated, who called a number of superintendents, including ours, um, who really advocated for this. And she really gave credit um, to a lot of people in our local area for. Um, giving really strong ideas that she demonstrated examples of how they were incorporated into the act. So that was impressive. Um, she calls it a good act. She doesn't call it a great act, but she, she said over and over again that this could be a great act. Um, but the problem is, the way she, she discussed it is that after all this time that people put into discussing this and debating it, there's a really, really short window now of opportunity to influence it. So when she says it could become a great act, she's looking for the public and for us and all of anybody and everybody to respond quickly. So I think that's the message I wanted to send. And please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think she said tomorrow at 2 o'clock is the deadline for amendments. And she is receiving a lot, and she's going to do all she can with her staff and her colleagues. But it's really a sharp, quick turnaround window. Uh, and the vote is next week. And she's very committed to making this um, even better than it is. Um, she highlighted more or less what's in the fact sheet. I didn't hear anything different, but please add if you did. Um, but I, I, I just think because of this quick turnaround, we also haven't received any information yet that tells us exactly what it would mean for our community. So that's unfortunate, but um, I am certainly very impressed with her commitment and her team's commitment to ensuring that she looks at what each school district is going to be receiving. And obviously, if there are some concerns, try to respond to that. But the timing is, um, you know, everybody's happy that the money will be available soon, actually beginning next school year. Not this school year, but next school year. Um, but the turnaround window, she expressed, was a little bit disappointing, but we still have a, a few minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my update. Yeah. And I just wanted to add that um, the one question I did have for her was whether or not there would be the possibility for her to add in, um, an amendment um, regarding um, a commission or study of some sort um, to examine charter school funding mechanism. And she had uh, apparently also heard already from the Amherst School Committee. Um, I'm guessing it was Peter Denling. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and she was already working on an amendment, and so she does have every intention of filing an amendment because that's a really important piece of, of the legislation that's missing as far as we're concerned. So I'm very appreciative for her for, for looking into that piece of it for us. Okay, excellent. Yes, it'll be a rather rapid debate. There's going to be one day of debate um, in the Senate, and then it'll go to the House, and there'll be a similar short time frame and there's no numbers or information available. So um, you're right to be concerned and skeptical of this, but we'll try to get as much information as we can. So anyway, um, okay, any other announcements? Uh, sort, of, uh, sort of school related, starting at the high school and going downtown and coming back again tomorrow afternoon at 5.30 is a, uh, it's a bicycle ride with a uh, focus on climate change. Any other announcements? 
Ms. Fallon. Um, there still are spots available for the workshop um, Saturday in Springfield um, starting at 9 a.m. Um, on becoming more engaged and inclusive ed educational leaders, pathways for supporting our LGBTQ students. Um, if anyone wants to register, you can go to the MASC.org website. Thank you for that reminder. Any other announcements from school committee? Okay, hearing none, um, we have a very brief uh, consent agenda this evening. Uh, we have one field trip approval. It's the RK Finn Ryan Road, grade five. I'm going to Nature's Classroom in Beckett, Massachusetts on November 5th through the 8th, 2019. I would accept a motion to approve the consent agenda. Motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor of approving the consent agenda, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? <clears throat> Any abstentions? Okay, so the consent agenda is approved. Next, we have a series of reports and recommendations. Um, we have, first off, uh, several, uh, three job descriptions um, that I believe are related to the new uh, grant funding that we received, and Josh uh, Dixon is here to talk about them. The first one is the CPPI grant coordinator. Josh, if you want to go through the, that for us. Sure. Um, so as part of our preschool partnership initiative, um, we have three different positions, the first of which is the grant coordinator, which is sort of the boots on the ground coordinator of the programmatic and fiscal responsibility um, As a rather large grant, it is a 200 day um, position, which brings us into, we wrote the Northampton Public Schools um, program as an 11 month program because our summer programming is um, integrated. So it includes typical students as well as students with disabilities. Um, so that allows the grant coordinator to be there um, beyond our 180 days um, and also allows for them to serve as a member of the leadership team and serve as the liaison for um, the advisory council as well, which is made up of um, educators from each of the early learning programs as well as from our staff and our related service providers. Um, we based the salary in the grant off of a sort of teaching position um, with some leeway based on the fact that we're starting late. Um, so that was one concern that had come up, sort of the applicant pool. Um, and one thing that was very important to us was giving the opportunity for it to be either a DESI licensed position, um, which would be similar to our current staff, um, or a license of a director or certified um, educator from early education and care, um, which is who supervises our grant. Um, so that opens up our candidate pool wider, which we felt was um, important considering the fact that it's a community grant and it's not just based for the school department. Okay. Are there any questions about uh, the job description that's before us? Um, if, um, would you be willing to make a motion just to approve it, just to get it on the floor? Yeah, make a motion to approve the job description for a CPPI grant coordinator. Okay. Second. Second for Mr. Meyer, and you have a question. I do. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Josh, for working so quickly on this. Obviously, there's a lot of work involved in the job description and et cetera. Um, I'm, I'm just not aware of why the grade is NA and why the bargaining unit is non-represented. I think I just need to more fully understand that. Can Dr. Provost, do you explain? Sure. In part because, as Josh explained, this is an 11-month position. It's outside of any of the positions that are in our current bargaining units. Um, you should know that although these three non-represented positions are proposed through the grant and actually were included in the grant that was approved, there are also four represented positions that are part of the grant as well. So these are new things that don't currently exist within any of our bargaining units, and so our um, thought is that they should be made non-rep. What's the advantage of that versus making them rep? not having to reopen the recognition clause of the contracts. Uh, so as this, I notice this is the same for the other two positions, or one's a stipend, right? But the other, the two, there's two positions that had that. So has this been run by NACE? Are they in the- It group? hasn't because they're non-rep. Isn't that a catch-22, they're non-rep because- They do have the, I mean, they do have the opportunity under labor law to petition to have any employee yeah. be brought into the bargaining unit. So that's still an option, but it's you know quite common, particularly with grant funded positions, yeah. to do them as non-rep positions. Um, so they would still have that option if that if they felt uh, so strongly. 
Yeah, yeah I guess I, I would think in just in terms of what Josh was saying about making this available to as many people. So if there's a teacher internally or from another district that you mentioned, I don't know what the salary is, but you mentioned it's comparable to a teacher. So what would be, would, would, would we then be making that disadvantage, would that be a disadvantage or make it be unappealing for somebody who wanted to take their experience either in, internally or from another district and apply for this position? Um, do you think? I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm confused by that, but does that, knowing, yeah, how does that work? Are we I think, discouraging? I think, it's, I think it's unlikely that someone who's a part of Unit A would be interested in this position. And um, in most cases, it would be representing a pay cut for longer hours and longer and more days. Mm -hmm. um, so this would be someone who's coming from more of an administrative kind of role. Administrative kind of role would be more money, right? Not on a not on a per day basis, and many many um, administrative positions. So let me. If there's a teacher, who, so is this a so is this on the teacher salary schedule, or you're basing it on the teacher salary? Not on the teacher salary schedule. So it's less than is what you're saying. You're you're anticipating that this is paying there's, less. There's, so, if you were to calculate it on a per diem basis or a per hour basis, it would be less. It's not on the teacher's schedule because it's not part of the teacher's contract. There are no teaching positions um, that do this kind of work with this kind of a schedule. Right. So what is the salary? So the grant currently lists the salary is 55000 uh -huh. Right. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So there's been a motion made and seconded to approve this uh, job description for the CPPI grant coordinator. Are there any other questions? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, next up is a uh, description for a grant supervisor. Josh, do you want to? Sure. Um, so the grant supervisor position is a stipend position. Um, it's a stipend for $3,000 um, and it is a 12-month position. Um, so it's a role um, that would supervise both while the coordinator is present as well as while the coordinator is not as our early learning programs are in session 12 months out of the year. Um, some of the major sort of, discre not discrepancies, but differences between the coordinator and the grant supervisor is that the grant supervisor needs to hold a Massachusetts um, Administrator of Special Education license because we have students who are receiving um, itinerant services over the course of the school year as well as the remaining two months when we are not in session. Um, and so to ensure that there's compliance um, with regulations, we thought that that was something that was important. They also serve as the Leadership Council Chair. Um, so the Leadership Council meets for 12 months. Um, so we have 12 meetings um, and that is sort of the stipend from uh, that position for that position, I should say. Someone like to make a motion to approve this uh, just for purposes of discussion, debate? So moved. Okay. Second. Second, okay. Any questions about this grant supervisor uh, job description? Yes, Mr. Um, so who's gonna, who's gonna fill this role? Has that been determined yet or is it no, an application process? Open for an application process. So, so any individual who holds an administrator's license um, as well as meeting the requirements of um, the other portions would right. be eligible. So this is likely to be an internal person? I think it's likely to be. Yeah. So my, I, I'll, I just, I mean, you guys are so overworked as is, I, I just feel, I mean, I, we can make it 100,000 bucks, it still doesn't feel fair to me, but I don't know a better solution. The 3,000 bucks doesn't sound like that much actually, but um, I just, I'm just, concerned about adding more to people's plate already from our administrative and I, I trust that you've discussed this with them, John, so maybe you have a candidate who is willing to do it. That's just, I'll, I'll certainly endorse the idea. I just want to express that concern and I'm sure you've thought about it already, right? So, and I would just point out that it's not limit, limited to people who are currently administrators within the district. It just needs to be someone with administrative licensure. There are many people who have administrative licenses who don't use them. Um, oh, okay, right, in fact, that's right. why UMass shut down their program. So it could be somebody, it could be a teacher. Yep. I, I, I yep. Yep. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Ms. Fallon. Um, 
I noticed that it requires travel. Is there going to be an additional travel stipend offered, or is that three thousand dollar stipend going to cover everything? The stipend is all this um, in, in here. We do have money in the um, grant, I believe, that can reimburse travel, but that doesn't have to be listed as part of the job description. Any other questions? Hearing none, all those in, f in favor of approving this grant supervisor job description, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, next up, the family advocate position. So the family advocate position is mirrored after our Head Start um, and Community Action partner job description for their family advocate position. It's really to help bridge the gap of communication and sort of access, um, not only to our programming, um, but also the programming of our early learning programs. Um, and so it's really to serve as a bridge between um, the school department, the early learning programs, and our families. Um, we are looking for a candidate who is bilingual, um, preferably, just because uh, we have a increasing ELL population, um, and that's something that comes up frequently, especially between our communication with Head Start um, and Community Action and our families who are currently enrolled in our schools. Um, it too is a 200 um, day position and the salary that we have based in the budget currently is 23,000. Just to share that information. Okay. Does someone want to make a motion on this just to get it on the so floor? Okay. Is there a second? second? Okay. So motion made and seconded. Um, any questions or discussion about this position? Mr. Sorry. Mr. Uh, so what? How many FTEs is this? What percentage of an FTE is this? Um, so technically a 1.0 FTE for 200 days. Yes. And you're confident we'll be able to find somebody at that salary? That is, um, that's bordering on minimum wage or less, is it not? So we have flexibility in terms of the way that we sort of structured the budget yeah. um, to increase the salaries based on candidates. Um, and because it's likely, so we have yet to receive the standard contract form yeah. um, from the state, so we likely won't be starting until the middle of October to the yeah. end of October. Um, so the salary divided by the remaining days would be higher, if that makes sense. Well, what's, um, I'm not sure it makes sense to me. What is that? <laughs> so for example, it's yeah. $23,000 for the entire length. So yeah. if the person only works, oh. you see what I mean? If they start late, it'll if be a higher late, per diem, right? It'll be a higher per diem rate. But yeah. We also have the capacity um, based on the candidates with which to amend the grant to increase the salary lines. Right. So, I mean, theoretically, then somebody can make 23 for eight months if it's not till later, but then they would get this job next year. If they continue, then we would pay them proportionally 50% more because it's 12 months rather than eight months. So no, in the sense that we only have budget projections for next year, yeah. so we don't actually have a confirmed amount of total for the grant next year. Um, so it could very well be that the salary would vary between this year and next year, irregardless of yeah. what funding is available for us. All right. I, it, it seems to me like I, I appreciate what you're saying, it can go up, but if we're advertising at 23, if that's going to be in the advertisement, then we're, it seems like we're shooting ourselves in the foot where candidates are... You know, if there was a range even that we might be able to appeal to folks who are looking for the upper and we're turned down at the opportunity if you're not if we're not affording them that but you know if we're advertising at 23 that seems like uh, for a full-time position that seems to me very very low for the skills that we're looking for so we did, so we did have a discussion about that when we were reviewing sort of the requirements for the job description yeah. so it could very well be that we have the family advocate only be 0.8 for the 200 days. Yeah. So the FTE would be decreased. Ideally, we would have a 1.0 mm -hmm. um, FTE, but that might not be possible, sort of balancing with what's available in the grant for the salary. Right. And when we advertise, can are we putting in salary? Yes. And can we put in a range, since you're saying we have that opportunity to go higher? Would that be a reasonable request? I think so. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Other questions about this job description? Yeah. Same question about travel. Can that be explicit in there, that travel? Because this is someone who will be going among different sites. And, and um, I think we should put it in the posting. Yeah. Typically, we don't put our policies within the, the job post. description. Okay. Any other uh, questions about this? 
Okay, so all those in favor of approving this job description, uh, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, thank you very much, Josh. Thank, thank you. you. Next, we have a um, appointment of a voting delegate and alternate to the MASC Delegate Assembly, which uh, will be happening in November as part of the MASC uh, conference. And um, I'm seeking a nomination. Um, first of all, um, I know that Ms. Fallon, you are attending the conference, so this would be the um, these would be the resolutions that we're typically asked to vote on. Okay, um, so I would ask for a nomination of uh, to serve as a voting delegate at that uh, conference. Okay, will you accept that nomination? Okay. Uh, She's going to do a great job. Is there a second on the nomination? I'll second. That. Okay. Um, are there? Uh, is there anyone who? Uh, is there any nominations to serve as an alternate in the event that Miss Fallon doesn't attend? Um, I think we're we're allowed to appoint an, yeah. a primary and then an alternate to to basically to cast our vote at the uh, delegate conference. Um, I would, but I'm actually away. Okay. So, thank you. Is anybody else attending? Um, I was not planning on attending. No, it's on, it's in Cape Cod, correct? Yeah. In November. Is, uh, November first. No. Yes. Um, no, sorry, November. Dr. Provost, it's the day after Election Day through yeah. Saturday. Yeah. Okay. So it's that following Saturday. week. Okay. Uh, are we? Re I don't think we're required to have an all. No, okay. no, we're not required to have an all. Okay, so we could take our chances that you'll. Okay. Make it. I promise. Stay healthy. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, <laughs> so there's um, been a motion made and seconded to six through the eighth. Six yeah. through the eighth. Yes. Um, to appoint uh, Ms. Fallon to be our voting delegate at the MASC Delegate Assembly. Um, any discussion on that? Hearing none. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. And um, Ms. Fallon, you'll be, um, between now and our next meeting, you'll be providing some information about the proposed resolutions um, and possibly at the next meeting, possibly seeking some feedback on, on what the committee feels about them. Yes. So that you can vote the will of the school committee or try to do that. Definitely. Okay. I just would like to thank Laura for stepping up like this. She goes um, every year to this convention, and you put a lot of effort into it, um, and I, I really do appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Excellent. Okay. So um, now we move into uh, Section E of our agenda, which is the main uh, uh, purpose for this uh, meeting, um, and that is the presentation of the various school improvement plans uh, from each of our schools. Um, the first one that is listed tonight is the Bridge Street School uh, School Improvement Plan, and we have Principal Choquette, I believe, um, representatives of the school council and staff here as well. the river? We don't have to put it on the projector. All right. 
you do all of us, so that's great. Yeah. I'm Beth Chiquette, principal at Bridge Street School, and um, I have with me tonight from my school council, Ronnie Gold, one of our parent representatives, and then uh, Carol Ruffelart, who is one of the third grade teachers at Bridge Street School. Um, so tonight we're presenting to you two documents. Um, one of the things that we felt strongly about as a school council that we talked a lot about last year was every year we come and present a new student uh, a new school improvement a plan to you but we never really talk about how we did on the one that the previous year so we thought um, that it would be beneficial for you to see how we felt like we did on the plan that we presented the previous year and we actually it was one of our goals in our school improvement plan last year um, so Ronnie, Carol, and I are going to um, quickly kind of go through each of the goals from this past year and report out how we did on, on that. And I'm going to switch places with Ronnie because he's going to present the first goal. Um, and so this uh, first goal, uh, I'm Ronnie Gold, I'm a parent at Bridge Street School. Um, this first goal was the creation and the use of our rubric. Um, and so, if, as you see in each of the goals, we have um, three categories that we met, we partially meet, met, or we did not meet the goal. And then over on the right side, we have um, the evidence that we used to show whether we met it, partially met, or did not meet. And so this goal we identified as having met it as we created the rubric in February, and it was finalized by the school council. Um, we piloted it in the spring by working at collecting um, evidence on it and we're able to um, this September uh, really go back and look and, and assess ourselves and um, met as a school council to see which categories we felt we landed in. Um, as you can see that third bullet there is that it's a legacy goal meaning that we're going to keep going back to this rubric. It's not a goal that um, to create one and use one just for that year, it's going to be used every year. And so that was our first goal that we met. So our, our second goal, um, Carol and I are going to um, take turns on each of the objectives. We felt like we, we met this goal. Um, for providing ongoing training to the faculty and staff on the curriculum and assessments while increasing our understanding and um, commitment to becoming more culturally proficient in order to improve academic achievement and to create a more welcoming school to all of our families. And Carol's going to present the first objective. Okay, the first objective is the principal and school district will continue to provide ongoing training in the curriculum programs in order for teachers to have a better understanding of the curriculum and programs to ensure we're teaching to fidelity. And on the evidence side, you'll see that we have monthly grade, living, grade level meetings, which is district wide, monthly ELA math K through five department chair meetings, which are district, monthly CTL meetings, um, first and second grade AVMR um, PLC, they met two times a two times a, um, a month at, B at Bridge Street. Um, math and ELA coaches worked with grade levels and individual teachers observing, modeling, and coaching them in readers and writers workshop and math investigations. Uh, we had summer social studies camp. More uh, teachers were trained in the AV AVMR and currently 14 teachers at Bridge Street School are trained in AVMR 1 and two and oh and three and AVMR AVMR two. Two teachers were 
went this summer for Orton Gillingham training. And let's see, in September and October of this year, four more teachers will be trained in AVMR. For the next objective, the principal will provide opportunities for additional planning time for teams of teachers uh, to meet monthly um, for as long as resources allow. So this is something the school council um, worked at when we were working on um, some of the, the budgeting last year. We surveyed teachers um, around professional development monies and um, they unanimously wanted more money to be able to work together within the school rather than being sent out to um, different PD opportunities. So we offered this to all grade level teams um, last year and the first and second grade teachers were the only grades that took advantage of it and that's how the PLCs that Carol was talking about in ABMR happened um, twice a month. We were able to pay for teachers to do that um, with the help of Nancy Cheevers um, to be able to do that uh, twice a month. Let's see here. Did I skip one? I can't. No, okay. Make, making sure. The next one, the ILT, our instructional leadership team, um, worked or will work with uh, and support teachers in working with our lowest performing students identified by the state MCAS in order to meet the demands of the new state accountability system. They will do this by analyzing the data and sharing it with staff. The ILT will share strategies that will help support struggling students as well as provide coaching to teachers to help support their instructional practices. Um, so last year, the ILT, um, after analyzing our MCAS data from um, the previous year, um, we met with teachers um, in early December and we broke out into small groups of vertical teams and with our, our math coach, our ELA coach, and went over the data um, on the lowest performing students from the MCAS. The faculty worked in small groups um, sharing strategies that they were using and hearing about new strategies from other teachers um, that they could try in their classrooms. Um, last year's data uh, for the lowest performing students, 54% of those students improved in ELA and 69% improved in math. And last year's data, um, if they were, the state was still using the same accountability system, last year would have been the year we came out of level three. Our science scores tripled last year um, for meeting or exceeding, and we had the second highest growth score out of the four elementary schools last year. And then some highlights from the 2019 um, MCAS that just came out, um, happy to say that Bridge Street School is no longer in need of assistance or intervention. We are classified as making substantial progress towards our goals and our lowest performing quartile in ELA improved. They were still below the target by 4.2 points but had typical growth um, and fell at 46.8. And then our lowest performing quartile in math exceeded their targets by 8.5 points which was an increase of 12.2 points from 2018 and they exceeded typical growth with an SGP of 60. And so typical growth is between 40 and 60, um, with 40 being low and 60 being high. Um, and the, the last part of the goal is the principal will provide training to the faculty and staff on culturally sensitive classrooms and schools in order to become more culturally proficient and to become more comfortable in offering support to our most vulnerable and most marginalized families. And we're partially met this. Um, if this was evaluated through the teacher evaluation system, worked with teachers on gender identity and the use of literature pertaining to the subject, um, increased library, library offerings to include more literature that represents our diverse population, trauma, trauma poverty trainings, we're district-wide, anti-bias committee, district-wide, and more teachers providing trans, trans, translations for communications. BSS weekly newsletters can be translated into 100 plus languages. Um, and continuing this year, we have gender training in October, and robocalls are sent out in home languages. Um. I'm going to read our third goal. Uh, Sam Hopper, another parent represent, representative, was not able to be here today. Um, and our third goal was to increase communication between the classroom and home and continue ongoing communication between the, between the school and the home. And it relates to the district goals numbers one and two. Um, 
for our first sub goal um, that the classroom teachers will provide culturally proficient monthly updates to families, including topics and units being studied in each course subject. Um, they, we partially met that goal, and uh, Principal Shaquette and the, and the teachers uh, collected some data where 85% um, of teachers met or exceeded the goal. Um, exceeded the goal, and one teacher sent home, sending a home, excuse me, 10 communications throughout the year. One teacher sent home eight, and one teacher sent home four. However, that teacher did do frequent online communications through other platforms like Class Dojo. Um, the sub goal was teachers will, the second bullet is teachers will provide resources they can opt to use either in electronic or paper format, and that was met as uh, teachers were offered assistance and templates to use to send home um, monthly in contact with parents. And some teachers used paper, some teachers used websites, and some used Class Dojo as well. And the last bullet was that we um, evaluated as being partially met. And this was that teachers will provide evidence of culturally proficient communication through the teacher evaluation system. Um, and for that one, teachers made progress, progress with this, but are still improving this area. And so that one was partially met. And that was our third goal from last year. Oh, excuse me, there's two more bullets. Uh, and the next two bullets, uh, the principal will continue to send home weekly newsletters and be working with the adjustment counselor and providing principal chats in the community. Um, the principal chats were held at the Grace House, Forbes Library, and at the school. And the weekly, uh, principal weekly is sent home each week and translated uh, available in 100 plus languages. So we said that that one was met. And now the last bullet is that principal will com communicate the importance of collecting and analyzing assessment data in order to adjust the curriculum in our teaching practices to ensure the highest quality of education for our students and to maximize equity of the assessment process to benefit all students through the, the entirety of the learning levels. Um, this one was met through um, and it, through ongoing mon uh, morning, uh, Monday morning newsletters, faculty meetings, the ILT team and the student support team, uh, monthly special education meetings uh, with the school psychologist supported this, working as a district on the unified uh, mindset around RTI was a, a support for this and evidence, as was the SST process being streamlined to include data from teachers during the SST meetings. And that's our third goal. And uh, the final goal was to develop a comprehensive plan to best meet the needs of our students who struggle socially, emotionally, and behaviorally. Um, so um, this past year, um, we developed what we call the SEBEL team, the Social Emotional Behavioral Learning Team at Bridge Street. And our um, SEBEL team meets bi-weekly to kind of discuss, we focus on systems and structures and protocols within the building. And then we meet weekly um, in a separate meeting to dis discuss individual students and challenges they may be having and how we can best support them and teachers. Um, we worked with teachers on having a better understanding of a tiered system of supports um, through small group instruction um, for tier two, or tier one's general education, small group instruction with tier two and individual support or intensive supports in tier three. Um, we've created a check-in and check-out system, which is a, kind of a, a tier two approach to supporting students. And the check-ins and check-outs are typically done with our school psychologist, sometimes our adjustment counselor. We've also created a response system for students um, who struggle in various ways throughout the day. We use logging and log, we log and track data uh, for calls to the office, students sent to the office or requests for how, who needs and how often they're calling for assistance in classrooms. And we review that data um, every other week with the SEBEL team. We met with grade level teams um, on supporting them around social emotional learning and continue to support teachers through the SST process. Um, this year, the SEBEL team held two retreats during this past summer. Um, two all-day retreats and um, a description of tiered support was added to the 2019-2020 uh, resource guide uh, for caregivers at Bridge Street. Uh, the next bullet um, was around um, teachers holding their morning meetings and really um, ensuring that students have an understanding of the school's positive behavior intervention system as well as our second step in zones of regulation curriculums. And this is done every day in the classroom and it's also done through the school-wide celebrations um, where I reinforce um, these things at the celebrations. 
and the faculty and staff implement behavior plans created by the SEBEL team um, and use as a tool to help with their most uh, struggling students and to help them feel successful in school. Um, these, the behavior plans are created by the SEBEL team, the BCBA, uh, we use Tate Behavioral as well. And support is given to the teachers on how to implement these plans. And then we also review and discuss feedback from teachers. Oftentimes these plans are put in place and can be overwhelming for teachers to kind of track the data and, and do some of these plans within the classroom. So we, we get their feedback and we adjust plans so we can make it doable for, for the teachers. Um, and then, like I said earlier, our second step in PBIS is reinforcing weekly celebrations. And um, the last bullet at the bottom here, um, we put partially met. Uh, because when we were developing this plan, we were in the process of trying to obtain grants for trauma training and restorative practices training, but we were not able to obtain the grants. We were trying to do it through NEF, but the cost of bringing people, folks in to do that kind of training um, was very expensive and we just weren't able to find grants to cover that cost. Um, we are hoping that we will be able to do that in the future. Um, we work with ESPs monthly. I have a monthly meeting on social emotional learning and our BCBA also provides training for our ESPs around working with students with challenging behaviors and with disabilities. And so that is our rubric on last year's plan. Um, the re and the, the reason why I always have a teacher, teachers and parents here, if they can attend from the, from the school council, is you know a big goal of the district is a unified mindset and probably similar to school committee. You know, we have lots of discussions throughout the year, and sometimes we agree and sometimes we disagree. But in the end, when we're when we're completing um, a plan, we come together as a unified mindset, and it's really important that. Um, and I'm grateful for. Carol as a teacher representative and Ronnie as a parent representative being here to share this with you. Um, the new school improvement plan, I will just go through quickly because um, we've talked long enough and I know my colleagues would like to go home. Uh, so um, what we did um, with the new school improvement plan is we took um, some things from last year's that we felt like maybe were only partially met um, and we integrated it in, into um, the goals for this year. Last year we had a very ambitious, as you saw, um, school improvement plan with many, many objectives. So this year we tried to make it a little smaller. Um, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of work in one year. We try to do one year plans. So um, in our new plan we have, um, actually this is a district goal, um, collaborative structures and supports. It's um, the district improvement goal number three. And our bullets under this goal school structure time throughout the school year for individual and collaborative reflection to use data to inform instruction for all students and to thoughtfully meet the professional standards for teachers. The principal will, cre will create schedules and structures to support collaboration with ESPs, interventionists, grade level colleagues, vertical teams, special educators, and subject area teachers. And the principal and school district will continue to provide ongoing training in the curriculum and programs in order to ensure understanding and that teachers are using them to fidelity. Goal number two was, um, or is a goal that I feel like um, we, we worked hard at and <coughs> made a lot of gains, gains, but there's still a lot of work to be done around cultural proficiency, so we felt it important to keep in our school improvement plan. And you'll see here, the principal will provide training to the faculty and staff to increase their understanding and knowledge of cultural proficiency and to ensure we, we are offering support to our most vulnerable and most marginalized families. And all classroom teachers, K through five, will utilize the same template for communicating to families what students are learning in each of the core subject areas. Teachers will provide culturally proficient communication to their families, which is part of the evaluation system. The template that's mentioned here, this came out of um, the vision and action form we had at Bridge Street School last year. Um, and one of the things that kept coming up um, from our parent community is they didn't feel like they were getting enough communication from classrooms to home about what their kids were learning in the, co the core subject areas. And they're also looking for consistency. And so we developed, um, with the help of David Cantler, um, uh, kind of a template for teachers that's the same from K to five that is simple for them to fill out, to send, send home monthly to their families, just around the, this is what we're doing in math this month, this is what we're doing in ELA, um, science and social studies. And then teachers still have the opportunity, some of them use Class Dojo to send home pictures and kind of projects and activities that are going on, they still can use that, but they are all being asked to use this same kind of template around 
um, reporting on the core subject areas so teachers know what to expect grade to grade grade to grade and then finally our third goal is around student achievement um, we made great gains in focusing on our lowest performing students um, last year especially in the area of math and so we want to continue that goal with a focus um, on ELA um, and with a goal of getting that SGP up to 50 or better in ELA on the lowest performing group and as I said earlier typical growth is between 40 and 60 and then our ILT will continue to work with teachers um, on the new demands of the state accountability system um, and then you see our legacy goal there at the bottom of continuing to do a rubric and really hold ourselves accountable to our school improvement plan and that was a lot of talking and I'm sorry but <laughs> <laughs> thank you does anyone have any questions about uh, either progress on last year's plan or this year's proposed school improvement plan? Yes. Um, I, I have a couple questions, but mostly comments. Um, thank you. I love the rubric. I was going through these, reading through these, thinking um, I would really love to hear how last year's went, and you did it, and I just... Um, I'm not sure if we're going to hear that on the other ones, but I thought it was really helpful from a school committee member perspective who isn't as connected with some of the schools to hear what happened, and I really appreciate it. It's, it's awesome. Um, and I'm really thrilled to see the data on the math, and um, we sat here and looked at some data last year, and this is very exciting, and we heard about some changes that were being made, and I guess a small follow-up question is, with all that growth in math, are you going to continue doing the same things this year, or do you, in, one of the goals is to try to um, focus more on the ELA, and I understand that, and I'm just curious, does the math stay the same, or do you have to put more focus on the ELA? So math will stay the same, and we'll still focus on math, and um, we just didn't put it in the plan. Um, so what's new that's not in the plan for this year is at Bridge Street, we've implemented 30-minute intervention blocks um, every day for both ELA and math for all students. Um, so that's new starting this year, and um, kind of the way it works is um, grade level teams will do a pre-assessment of, of their choosing. It could be different month to month depending on what the teachers choose, and they'll group students based off of that pre-assessment to be really be able to provide some targeted instruction and in where they're la lagging skills depending on what it is that they're testing them on. So that's new this year. Um, and we're taking the month of September to do those assessments and get those intervention blocks up and going October, but we're doing that for both ELA and math this year. So that's new. Mr. Meyer. Yeah. So it's a question about the st structuring of time for collaborative work. And you know, this is always the ideal, and it's always difficult to do. And I'm wondering, how are you going to gather feedback from staff as to, one, whether the collaboration was fruitful in terms of bringing together people and having a structure that they can actually feel like they made some progress, and also frequent enough? Because I know that you know, free, you know, in my work, we'll have a collaborative group that'll meet once every three months. Mm -hmm. And so it's, you know, so there's that balance of, you know, I see the list is very comprehensive because you do, you know, you don't want to have people in their silos, but if I'm a teacher and I'm going to work with uh, ESPs and interventionists and grade level colleagues and subject, you know, colleagues, that's five or six groups that I need to meet with in a 10 month year. So I'm just, what kind of structure are you going to use so that at the end of the year you can evaluate and say, these structures really worked and how are we going to change them to work better next year? So it's really hard, right? As, as you know. Um, we have what we call collaboration subs in the budget, and but sometimes it's hard just even to get the subs to come in for, to cover teachers. So we do the best that we can with what we have in the building. We try to do a combination um, of during the day, which is harder, and then I do my best to try to incorporate that kind of learning and collaboration in a faculty meeting because I have that time with them. Um, it's sacred time, right? Um, it's And it's once a month, and um, that's how we did some of the MCAS data last year is we took that, that faculty meeting time to really have some vertical groups and really have really targeted discussions around that. Um, typically what I would do is I would either ask teachers or develop some kind of survey to show you know what worked what didn't work what would you like to see change how would you like to see it different um, for for the next year so um, just getting their feedback and then um, as an ILT assessing that feedback and seeing how we can 
move forward and make changes where necessary. But it's it's the collaboration piece is hard. Um, they just because it is it's trying to find coverage, but um, we really do try our best to cover as many people as as we can and. One of the challenges we have, Carol's grade actually is co-taught, so there's four teachers in that in that that grade. So trying to cover all four, just the four teachers, never mind any ESPs that might work in that grade level, um, is is hard. But um, we try to do it the best that we can, and we try to match it up with the after school and um, faculty meetings as well. So, yep. Any other questions or comments about the Bridge Street? Yes, Mr. Cobb. Thank you. A um, couple of comments and a couple of questions, but I remember about a year ago, Mr. Gold had presented on behalf of the Bridge Street Committee, Bridge Street School Council, sorry, the rubric idea. So kudos for developing that. And, um, you know, developing a rubric is one thing, but utilizing it is another. And it's really, really impressive how when you recapped what you did last year, obviously there was a lot of thinking about reflecting on what actually occurred. Um, maybe you've always done that, but as a school committee member like Dr. Voss said, now that we see it and we can appreciate what went into it, it's extraordinarily helpful. I think it just personally really helps me further understand the great efforts that you guys make and reflecting on it and seeing it on paper, maybe just and maybe off record we can talk about whether it, whether this experience was different and whether you want to modify or whatever, but it was quite thrilling to see that. And thank you and congratulations for moving forward with that. Um, one of the things I wonder with, when you looked at last year's, well, just look at last year's accomplishments and, and the, the first part of your presentation, did you and your council also look at, um, so what was the impact of all this effort? I mean, you just have a list of so many things that you did. So have you stopped to take a breath and go, so as a result of all that, There's what no was breathing. the impact? There's never any breathing. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, like, is there, yeah, go ahead. I, I think, um, you know, at the last couple of school council meet, like we had a meeting in September, and then we, of course, met at the end of the year. I think when we started to compile this, we were, we, you, you kind of look at it on paper, and you're like, wow, we, we did a lot. and um, you look at it and you wonder how you did it because there's a lot here. Like yeah. I said, this was pretty aggressive. I think Molly, you were at the at one of the end of the year right. um, council our council meetings and commented on how much was here. Um, so I think over um, as we roll into a new council, which will start up in October. Um, you know, looking at the impact this had, I think, and I'm only speaking for myself, I can't, I'm not going to speak for Ronnie and Carol, but just the idea of going through the process of the rubric um, and having the opportunity to really talk about the things we do with um, our parents and our community members on, on the council who aren't, you know, the teachers there and, and I'm there and we know the things that we're doing every day, but I yeah. think for a parent or um, for our community representative who's not here tonight, I think it was really helpful for them to see what we did and the impact that it that it had on us. So yeah, that's great. And I think that you're gonna um, you're gonna want to continue some of these things and add to it. So I mean, at some point, it's going to become unsustainable. So just to stop, if you can find the time and go, well, these are the things that really resulted in the kind of things that we wanted, and these are the things that we put in a lot of effort, but maybe not realizing the, the impact that we anticipated mm -hmm. might help you just to uh, prioritize moving forward. Yep. So I, 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 would, I would say the same thing for this year's uh, school improvement plan. You have wonderful ideas, but what's, what I'm not seeing is what you anticipate the impact to be, what the, you expected results would be, particularly how it might relate to some of the, um, the new district um, accountability system in terms of is this going to impact student attendance, student growth, student academic scores. Um, you have some of it here for sure. So I'm just wondering again, um, I guess I'm just encouraging guys as you move forward this year to constantly look at what is the outcome of your efforts um, and that would be a wonderful way to kind of celebrate all the efforts that your teachers are putting into this to see that there's some some critical outcomes that I know everybody's working for on a daily basis sure. but overall a really nice presentation and really uh, nice efforts through and through thank you any other questions or comments from school committee okay thank you very much thank you. and thank you your team Okay, so the um, next um, uh, SIP presentation is from Jackson Street School and Principal Gwen Agna. Good 
evening. I want to introduce our co-chair, Mark Lucier, and uh, he's really been very instrumental in keeping our council going and enthusiasm for it. So I appreciate his coming tonight. Uh, this is my final school improvement plan, the 24th. Um, I, it's very interesting to me. I looked in the file drawer in our, in our office of all the school improvement plans that I've done, we've done over the last 24 years. And interestingly, they used to be like this. I don't know, Leslie knows. <laughs> so that we had to have one school improvement plan presented at each meeting instead of all together um, because we had uh, a chart and rubrics and when we were able to do things and how many things we were able to accomplish and um, we met twice a month. Molly knows because she was on the, so that was the requirement that we had to meet twice a month. Um, it was useful, I think, especially looking back and seeing everything laid out in that kind of format. There was a point at which we were encouraged to do one pagers or less and really speak to um, in very bulleted ways, which is what I'm still doing. Um, and I know that the superintendent is interested in trying to unify the school improvement plans and maybe that's where we can go back to. I'm happy to show you my library <laughs> of school improvement plans. And uh, you know, I think it was, I think we missed it when we stopped doing it because it was rich in our conversations and I think the teachers were able to see what they were doing, you know, in, in a way that was um, written for them. And um, so now it's a, it's a different way of doing things, though the teachers on the, the council do have a lot of input and are really the prime movers of what we do. Um, so I've bulleted, and I won't go through it. I, don't, I think that you've seen it, and it's also a two-year plan. So this is our second year. And we've continued to do many of the things that we set for ourselves last year and are seeing more and more success in our abilities to meet together as grade levels. We do have a commitment to that once a month and get rotating subs for that, and it's really been great for helping with the inclusion model movement. Um, and the universal screening and the RTI and um, on and on and on, some of the things that you, I, I'm not gonna read it to you. Um, we, this year, have prioritized looking at our school survey from last year, the family survey, and increasing communication for families from the teachers. And they are starting to use some of those apps more. And, and I think some of them have commented that just sending photographs is often more powerful than trying to send little comments. So that that is something that we've really prioritized in terms of based on our school, our school survey. Um, we also, I have joined the standards-based grading and reporting committee, which is a priority from the district improvement plan. And I'm very excited to, in my last year, to perhaps come up with a new elementary report card. <laughs> um, and also the idea that we've been talking about for many years at our school around homework practices, and that's going to be more discussed as a district. Um, we are very specifically trying to document the vision and mission of our school. Um, because I've been there for so long, and we have developed a lot of traditions and ways of doing things and it's not something that we're going to give as a template or a contract to a new principal but the entire faculty staff and the families and the students have been very interested in trying to document what jackson street's about and has been about and we have a transition team working with chipwood who, and they are accumulating all the data and hoping to put together a variety of formats so that not only can somebody who would apply for the job understand sort of who we are, but also for those who are interested in just knowing more about it, some of the, the sort of drill down that you don't always get as parents or as even as fifth grade teachers versus kindergarten teachers. 
So it's going to be in a DVD, we hope, and in a booklet and um, an exhibit, a culminating celebration. Um, so I'm excited about that, and it's probably the only way I'd like to end my time is having a celebration like that. What I thought about in thinking about coming here today, I wanted to talk about what Jackson Street was like when I first got there. Um, I was the early childhood coordinator and the civil rights coordinator for the district from 1990. And I was more privy to the statistics that Jackson Street was showing in our district. We had um, a significant number of free and reduced lunch families, 70%. Um, it was borderline segregated school because there were almost 50% students of the global majority. Um, it was a situation in which I know as a citizen of Northampton, my kids went to Jackson Street, but I had friends, I live in the Elm Street area, who said to me that we were sacrificing our children for our political ideals by sending them to Jackson Street. It was the black sheep and truly black in terms of there was racism and classism in thinking about what Jackson Street was. It really bothered me as a parent because I knew the inside story and I knew that it was more than that. And it bothered me as the desegregation and equity coordinator because it was a segregated school and it was easily dismissed. At the time when I took over the school, we had an associate superintendent in the central office. We had a grants coordinator. All of our schools had vice principals. We had an elementary librarian. We had a district science coordinator for the elementary schools. We had a district reading coordinator for the elementary schools. We had a school adjustment counselor and guidance counselors in all the elementary schools. We had recess and lunch aides specifically, and they worked in the morning so that they worked with teachers and supported the teachers and then they did the duties. We had two to three reading teachers in each school and two to three math teachers. Um, at the time I became the principal, I had worked with Bruce Willard, who was the superintendent, about the issues of seg segregation at Jackson Street from that point of view, from the equity point of view. And when he appointed me, he and I sat down and thought, we have to do something about this. Um, so I was very fortunate to have already worked with him and thought together that there are things you could do. We, we did a literature review about interventions in schools that had sort of more urban um, problems, as it were. <clears throat> so we looked at class size reduction. We looked at adding to the academic support services for the students at Jackson Street because there were so many of, of them at risk. We would really discussed the inequities that were very glaring in Northampton about Jackson Street. Um, again, it was this, the word on the street was don't send your kids to Jackson Street. Um, when we were able to do the class size reduction and reduce classes, when I started the classes were 28 to 30 students. Um, we reduced them to about 20 students and added ESL as well. We began to be able to basically address the needs of these high need students, as well as look at anti-bias practices. Um, Jackson Street had a very veteran staff of teachers. They were very committed, very intentional. Um, they also felt that they were the black sheep of the district because they put their their energy into a school where people didn't have a lot of respect for it. So we worked together on ways that they could understand that students of color and students in poverty, while they presented us with challenges, often behaviorally, there were still some things that we could do. Um, I began the first day that I came to visit Jackson Street as the um, applicant, even though I'd been a parent there for 12 years. I walked into the office and there was the Group W bench. And there was a big yellow bench and there were about seven fifth grade, six, no, there, we hadn't moved the sixth grade yet, but there were, they were fifth grade boys. And they all had spaghetti on them, dripping down all over the floor. And I thought, 
uh, do I really want to do this job? Um, and the, it really reflected the fact that there were a lot of food fights in the cafeteria. <laughs> there were a lot of fights on the playground. We had a lot of police involvement. Um, Hampshire Heights and Hathaway Farms, which used to be Hampton Gardens, were very full, and that meant that there were a lot of students living in challenging situations. Um, we had 350 discipline referrals to the office my first year. That's in 180 days. So I organized some students together and basically asked them, do we want to have a school like this? And they came together and said, not really. Is there a way we can address this? And we did, and we had a campaign of what makes a good school, what makes a safe school, what kind of code of conduct would make sense to students and get, give them the leadership around that. Um, within two years, we were able to reduce the discipline referrals to about 30 in a year. We wrote our own code of conduct because there really wasn't one that was child friendly at the time. And then through our school improvement plan, we, we were very intentional about what we needed to do at Jackson Street and what we needed to advocate for at Jackson Street. Um, fast forward, it's 24 years. Um, it's, the reputation has changed. Um, I think the practices that we began then are still there. And I think it has a lot to do with our school rules, which are be respectful, be safe, be kind, try your best, um, and play fair, and have fun. And that's what we hold to and every aspect of our time. We're not, it's not perfect. There are some challenges still, of course. And my concern as I leave this position and the Northampton Public Schools is that all of our schools have these situations more and more, and the high needs students are continuing to be there, and we have fewer services for them. When I think about what we had at Jackson Street when I when we did the intervention, it really was an intervention and it really paid off. It was in reducing class size and in having more services and also looking at the climate and respecting students and every family and welcoming every family and, and making it clear that there wasn't anyone to be on the outside. But again, I, as a citizen now will be a senior citizen with you and committed to this town. I will be working myself very hard to make things better. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Agna. I think we call that a mic drop. <laughs> it's okay. It's all right. No, no. No, it's okay. Are there any questions or any? I mean, it was. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. And thank you for 24, 25 years of, of that. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Honored. Okay. Um, next up. Uh, is lead school school improvement plan and we have principal Wentz here I'm vertically challenged so we'll bring this down good evening everyone um, I have moved to Florence and become part of the Northampton community I'm I haven't done my license or registration yet but I soon hope to do that and become part of the community so um, that piece has fallen into place and um, so on to the school improvement plan so uh, it was nice to meet with our school council uh, met with them in September to help put this school improvement plan together uh, some of this is part of the school improvement plan that they felt they still wanted to improve on as part of the school and um, we did it for one year the district will have a new five-year plan soon so we've done it for a one-year plan um, with four major buckets um, of course student growth and achievement and learning opportunities for all students with inclusion equity mutual mm -hmm. respect and expectations um, and providing educators with professional development to support our high-quality instruction 
Um, another bucket was developing a safe, inclusive environment um, in which students and educators' diverse backgrounds, identities, strengths, and challenges are acknowledged and respected. Uh, and develop age-appropriate social-emotional skills and strategies um, for our students who are in need um, for some more emotional support. Uh, increase our family and community engagement through shared values and maintaining and increasing communication. So many similar goals that other schools have. Um, we, we're fortunate we too have included um, a collaboration time once a month at Leeds this year. Uh, the teachers were very excited to have that opportunity. We did our first um, collaboration time this past month. Uh, we do certain grade levels on one day and certain grade levels on another day, but again, it's finding those substitutes to take on the teacher's roles to get the teachers the time to do that um, so we can have consistency as well. Uh, we're going to be um, continuing with the uh, bees at Leeds, and, and we're, we hope to develop that a little bit more uh, where we can establish uh, more common expectations, common language, and really uh, use the bees to promote the positive atmosphere at Leeds. And um, with that, we also hope to keep using all the kids all the time that Mr. Kanata had set forth and the last school council had set forth. Uh, they feel very passionate about all the kids all the time at Leeds. And last but not least, increasing our family and community engagement. As other schools have mentioned, increasing the classroom um, communication, the um, newsletters from the principal, which um, I'm working on. And I will say that I do like to include pictures of students and student work and things like that. What I'm struggling with right now is the students who can't be photographed. So I'm trying to be very mindful of when we do post pictures that we are abiding by um, parent and caregiver wishes. Um, so that way um, we're respectful in that manner. Um, but to showcase what we do very well at Leeds and um, so that we hope to get that rolling on a weekly basis. Um, and we do anticipate uh, seeking more parent input. Uh, the last parent uh, caregiver survey um, revealed they wanted more in social justice, more in cultural diversity, um, so we've included some of those things into the school improvement plan. Um, and then we too um, talked about developing a rubric to monitor the progress of the plan. Um, so we incorporated that in as well. So mine is a little short, um, but um, that's an overview. Any questions about the leads um, SIP? Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and then rounding out the elementary schools, we have uh, Principal Madden presenting Ryan Road School. Hi. Um, I just want to start with um, giving an appreciation for our amazing collaborative staff. Uh, I feel like we are all moving forward in the same direction and making um, both academic and social gains within our school community. And in spite of the incredibly hard work it takes for this to happen, our school is a joyful place to live and learn. And uh, school improvement would not be possible without our committed team. So I just wanted to start with that because that's the the basis of all of it, right? Um, highlights of the plan, I would say, are um, our data team, which has been hugely successful, and I think we are um, a model for how you can use data to, to drive instruction and um, targeted interventions that support academic su success and social and emotional needs. So I feel like we are really good at that right now, and. Um, really working together to organize that. We have a lot of teacher leaders in, my, in the district, and I have, have to read them because there are so many, and we have a huge percentage of our teachers um, acting as leaders. We have department chairs in ELA, in kindergarten, Andrea Gito, first grade, Diana Ramsden, fourth grade, Sarah Simmons, fifth grade, Michelle Andrews, 
and in math, we have second grade, Rebecca Natali, fifth grade, Travis Yegajinski. We have department chairs for Title I, Mary Beth O'Connor in reading, and Beth Brady in math. And we have CTLs, the curriculum teacher leaders. In kindergarten, Andrea Gito, first grade, Diana Ramsden, first grade, Bridget Pilas, third grade, Paula Cleary, fourth grade, Sarah Simmons, and ELL, Rachel Ellis. So it's a huge list. <laughs> and so uh, it's not surprising that we do well when we have so many leaders, right? Um, we have been hearing from parents that they would like more information about curriculum. So we have planned an academic information night next week. We struggled with when, the school council struggled with when that would be best, before or after open house. And so we're gonna see how many, we're hoping for a great turnout. Uh, and so that will be next Thursday. You're all welcome to attend. It's 5.30 to 6.30, so classroom teachers are going to give a half hour presentation twice so that parents could go to two. We're also, our data team will be presenting uh, around uh, what we do for school assess assessments and um, interventions. So we hope it's gonna be a great night. We'll only be serving hot cider, but you know, you can come. <laughs> um, we are working on adding titles to our library that, um, that add diverse perspectives, and we have a whole list. Our librarian is really pushing out uh, categories and titles and really, really trying to, to pay more attention to how we use that literature and making sure that people are aware of the literature. We've really been changing our library uh, quite a bit and updating that and so we want to make sure people are aware of that. Uh, we want to increase our opportunities for collaborative technology integration that boosts creativity and engineering. Uh, we're very excited about that. And we're continuing and strengthening our relationship with Grow Food Northampton. We have Thursday markets after school, uh, which are really great. And then uh, they go from our school to Florence Heights, which has been really fabulous. Uh, we have trips to Crimson and Clover Farm and the community gardens, and we have classroom education around local produce, food preparation, and healthy eating. Uh, and I know they've just received a large grant, so we're thrilled uh, with that. Um, I also want to say how much I appreciate the air conditioning that was installed uh, recently in our library. Now we have moved up into the, the realm of air conditioned buildings and <laughs> that's so great. Uh, and I'm hopeful that with capital funding we can increase our accessibility for all of our students uh, in bathrooms and on the playground. That's all I have to say. <laughs> Any questions? Okay. Any questions from Ms. Madden? It's Ms. Fallon. Um, so I kind of held up all of mine to the end, but I just, I want to say how much I appreciate um, that all four principals um, took kind of their own unique um, way of looking at this. Um, we have um, Principal Choquette kind of taking a look back at like what the, did they manage to accomplish and Ms. Agnell taking a look way back, <laughs> which I actually really, really love. That's something that I never knew, that I think that's a really great historical perspective um, to have. Um, and Principal Wentz, that's a great look forward, your first look, like that's really great, your first school improvement plan, like it's very exciting, I think. Um, and I have to say, um, Principal Matt, I love that you included, I know everybody's like focused on, well, how will you know if you achieved it? And you know, how will you measure your outcomes? I actually love that you put the beginning part of it, the essential questions, like what is guiding your process? Because sometimes I don't know what's prompting, you know, some of this work. And so I love that you included the essential questions for the work ahead and what was kind of guiding your process. Um, but I appreciate all the work everybody put in, and I love that you all kind of put your own unique spin on it. Um, so thank you all so much for your work on that, and to the teachers and um, parents on the councils, too. Thanks. Thank you very much, Principal Matt. Okay, so now we uh, move up to JFK Middle School, and Principal Wilson is here, and her team. Thank you. And uh, Associate Principal uh, Vinnie Napoli is here as well with me. So I just wanted to start by um, taking this opportunity to thank all of you and the superintendent for all your support of our students, um, our fabulous students, and to thank the amazing educators at JFK who are so committed to teaching our middle schoolers. Um, I'd also like to thank the JFK School Council for their collaboration in developing our plan. Um, we had very thoughtful discussions from many different perspectives, um, which led to our final document. 
and I'm really excited to present our school improvement plan this evening. Um, it really reflects our priorities and will guide our work for student and school community growth. So it's a new plan. We accomplished much of our previous plan and things that we felt like we continued to need to work on are reflected in this plan. Um, so we're gonna start with goal one of the current plan. This goal really remains the same, but our action steps and measures of progress have changed. So our first goal is to continue to identify and implement structures and systems to positively impact school culture and support students who struggle socially, emotionally, and or behaviorally. This is connected to the district improvement plan as well. Um, so Vinny's gonna talk about a couple of the things we're gonna be doing. So our first bullet is really to continue implementing PBIS. And so this year we're going to continue with uh, expanding tier one interventions and supports and really looking at and implementing or starting to implement the tier two supports. We're going to empower our student ask ambassadors to really take a lead role inside of PBIS two and start really handing it over to our students. Um, in addition to that, we're going to strengthen our classroom practices by empowering our teachers. Um, that started about a week and a half ago when we had a professional development led by our staff on P3 and E, which is really about being positive, present, and um, predictable, and also really engaging students. The second way we're going to actually really start changing what we're doing for students here is by revamping our student support team. And for those of you that know, it's called SST. But a lot of schools use it as a pre-referral process and that's not something we've traditionally done here. So we're starting to bring in our teachers to our SST meetings to really focus on what's happening on the classroom for particular students and really making sure we're getting to students before they require any sort of plan and then recognizing if there is a need for a plan that that's what we're going to put in place for them. All right, a few other things under goal one. Um, we are looking to more fully develop service learning opportunities um, through community partnerships. One of the great successes of um, JFK has been our day of service. And so we're looking to expand that not only for the day of service, but for other opportunities for our students. We're also looking to um, implement more student internships. Uh, one of the things that the school council is very committed to, and we are as well as a school, is provide research-based vaping and marijuana prevention across grade levels, as well as uh, offering opportunities for education for our caregivers. And we're going to continue our work um, on anti-bias and equity, and um, we're going to form a building-based anti-bias and equity committee and we're hoping to include caregivers, um, faculty and staff, students, and community members. Um, goal number two is a little different. We've been focusing on communication over the past few years um, with the school council. Um, it's been one of our priorities. This year we're really focusing on communicating and our outreach and involvement with our families of English learners and former English learners called FLEPS. Um, and so this is all part of our turnaround plan to improve the attendance and academic achievement for our L's and our FLEPS. And um, some of the things that we're gonna be working on as a school council um, is to hopefully improve the attendance at our new EL PAC meetings. Um, we are working as a district um, and as a school to provide translation for all school documents and correspondence. We're um, hoping to provide family partners for all new students and caregivers, but also focusing on um, new English, uh, families of English learners. Um, we're hoping to host multicultural community events for our families and then hold events and activities um, out in the community facilitated by students and families and school personnel. Uh, our third goal uh, remains the same, focused on the achievement, um, academic achievement of all of our students and using data to inform our instruction, our decision making, and our student support. Um, we have been working as a school on implementing and learning uh, strategies to support our English learners and our former English learners. Um, so we have done some professional de development for teachers and ESPs and we're gonna continue to do that. Um, we are going to measure that by 
informative and summative and statewide assessment data, but really what we're focusing on is providing more support um, in the classrooms um, for our English uh, learners, and we're doing that by not only providing professional development, but also by we are now pushing in our um, English um, teachers of English learners. So we have a push-in model, and it's really been successful. Uh, we're providing targeted math intervention. Um, it's a new uh, program that we're running this year um, for six to ten weeks. It's focused on math recovery and the five practices of math, and um, we're using some progress monitoring and hoping to close some gaps and build some skills and really build the confidence level of some of our um, students in math. Um, the data team, as always, will be continuing to um, look at data and um, to help teachers um, with their practices based on data to improve student learning. Um, we are piloting um, open up resources uh, for math in grades six, seven, and eight, and we are going to expand our coaching model, we have, to include seventh and eighth grade math teachers, our math coaching model. Um, it will now include seventh and eighth grade teachers, not just sixth, and we're also including special ed teachers. What, some of the things we are doing. One of the struggles in writing a school improvement plan um, is prioritizing. There's so many things that we're doing and so many things that our school council wanted to include in our plan. I just have to say that we um, spent a lot of time really talking about what to include and then how to share all the other things that we're working on and that are happening in our building. So I welcome any questions that you might have. Thank you, Principal Wilson. Uh, Ms. Fallon, you have your hand up. Uh, so as a parent of two middle schoolers and a frequent player at your PTO meetings, um, I, none of this comes as a surprise to me. I know it's definitely um, priorities of a lot of the teachers and parents, but I have questions about a few things. Um, the family partners, when you, I, I don't know anything about that. When you say provide family partners for new students and caregivers, what does that mean? So it's an initiative that we're going to be doing across the district. Um, we are hoping to um, send out some information uh, to families and ask if they might want to be partners with new families coming into the district. It's really kind of in the um, you know beginning stages of developing this, but we've got some questions for families and we're looking for volunteers to partner with new families just to answer questions, help them with the transition to our community, to our schools, things like that. Um, great. Yeah, and it's something that um, one of our small kind of administrative leadership team groups, our equity group, is working on. So, okay. yeah. And that sounds awesome. And then the other question I had was about the pushing in of the English language teachers. Mm -hmm. And so to use that most effectively, are you having to then kind of group English language learners in larger groups in particular classrooms? Um, we have fairly... Pretty typically, we've scheduled students, depending upon their language needs, um, oftentimes two or three students together, um, which is helpful for um, professional development, the training we've offered teachers, and also um, the ability of our English, um, our teachers of English learners to really support the teachers. So the, they've been doing that kind of collaboration and that support and that um, previous to this, but now we have the opportunity with an increased FTE in um, that department to push in, and it, it's really been um, terrific so far. We just started, but the teachers are really working together, so if we have students um, who we do a workshop model with, where there's a mini lesson, then there's group work, then we can really offer some support, not only to, uh, not only to the students, but to the teachers making suggestions of things that would be helpful. We're really focusing on language objectives, tiered vocabulary, things like that. Um, so yeah, it's, I, I think it's gonna be really impactful for our students, for all of our students too, because those are strategies that are helpful to everybody. Right. Thank yep. you. Sure. Yes, Dr. Voss. Hi. Thank you very much, and I just wanted to um, echo a few things um, from earlier in terms of um, things that might last longer than a year, and I'm picking on, I'm picking up on under goal one at the very bottom, form a building-based anti-bias and equity committee, including caregivers, staff, students, and community members, which sounds so important 
to so many levels of things that we all hear are important um, to building the community and keeping everybody feeling included in it. And I, I just want to encourage you as that happens to report back. Um, sure. So not to lose this on, you know, this is one of the goals for this year, but whether it's a rubric or somehow reporting back, we started this and this was what worked and this is what didn't work and this is what where we're going with it. Um, because I think maybe other schools can learn from it and it just seems like a very important thing to start. Thank you. So one of the yeah. things that we've been doing is we've carried forward at the building level the anti-bias work that we've done um, as a district. And we've provided some on-site um, professional development for a team of teachers who are now bringing that out to their colleagues. And we're going to continue that work. Um, Gwen and I uh, were on the district civil rights committee. And then we brought those to our um, our, our building sites. And we've been trying to continue this work. And I think we're at the point now, again, where we're going to um, form a committee and hopefully make some significant difference for a lot of families and students. So, thank you. I'm just a similar comment on a bullet further down, and I'm jumping to the targeted math intervention, um, which again we've talked about, and I know it was in our budget. And I just think that's a really important area that we keep track of and don't just say that was a goal this year and then not come back to it next year and as a school committee member I'll be really interested in knowing um, over the period of a few years how that's working and um, is it, it, it are I, I'm just wanting to understand it slightly more detailed are we going to be able to cover this for all the kids who um, fall below the meets expectations or is it going to be a subset of those kids? Do we know? Uh, we don't know yet. I'm, it, it will depend on some of the assessments that we're using at the end of the six to ten week periods of time that we're doing this, but my, I, I believe looking at the number of students and the amount of time that we have dedicated to this, I think we will be able to, for sure. Great. That, that's good. Are you upset, Dr. Ross? Okay. Ms. Hennessy. Just, I don't know how I'm going to form this, but as having, like Laura, two kids in middle school, not so fun. I mean, I'm kidding. No, I'm kidding. It's easy. Um, but, you know, as a parent in elementary school, I always felt like I knew what was going on because I was so present and my kids were so talkative. And, and the elementary school teachers, and I had Ms. Agna as the principal, um, was so communicative. And I will say that my experience with my two children at um, JFK and then the brief time I was at the open house, this is actually the feeling I got that your priorities were. Mm -hmm. So other than, I can't be more detailed than that, but this is no surprise and I'm getting it from my kids and I got it from the teachers. And I just really appreciate that, that I think is like, such truth. It's not like um, words I can't say out loud, but it's great. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate that. Any other comments or questions? Mr. Cobb. Uh, um, thank you. Sure. Um, so when I, look, when I look at all these activities, and it's the same thing as I said to everybody, or I didn't comment in some cases, but it's really overwhelming, like how many wonderful ideas are put in place. So, um, but when I, when I look at some of the data, and some of the data that Dr. Provo shared last year, I mean, there are some major challenges that you're facing, particularly we discussed chronic absenteeism. And I'm just reminding myself here by looking at that data that there are subgroups um, much more significant or much higher numbers at JFK and the high school than the elementary schools. But you know, some of these numbers have only gotten worse. Um, and some of the academic scores have only gotten worse and they're very concerning. So I would say, do you have confidence that of all of your activities that you're putting into the school improvement plan. I'm not seeing anything that necessarily is targeting a specific sort of, we're going to reduce absenteeism or we're going to increase scores here and there. And I, I understand there's value in doing that. In some cases, not very valuable. But are you confident that all the things you're doing are going to help improve in these areas that I think we can all agree are fundamentally important to our education? Sure, I think the chronic absenteeism we're, you're talking about is um, focused on a subgroup of students. Um, as far as our um, state data, that was focused on a subgroup of students. And um, we certainly have put lots of efforts into changing that. And mm -hmm. we've had some really great um, progress um, in um, you know, making gains in the percentage of um, attendance and lowering that chronic absentee 
escapism already with our turnaround plan and our turnaround grant. Um, again, I think we're really focused on kind of what it is we're doing in the classroom, yeah. looking at our data, looking at our assessments, and, and um, um, putting in some real targeted interventions and um, supports for students. So I, I, to answer your question, I think we are right on track and yeah. hoping, hoping to see lots of improvement. Is our uh, the student um, coordinator that we're, the attendance coordinator we're hiring, that's just high school? No, that's district-wide. It is? Okay. Right. Um, do you see opportunities for that person to help? Sure, sure. We work with Kelly Knight really closely. Mm -hmm. Again, I think that overall our attendance rate is um, what this is expected by the state. Um, so we're, we're now really focusing on making sure that that's um, the same for all of our students. Um, have you looked at the new data that just came out last week? Um, briefly, sure. Okay. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah. And I, and I don't know whether I'm, are we able to say that we've made gain. We made gains. The embargo is lifted. Yes, you can. Yeah. So talk we, about that. we exceeded our um, state target for um, chronic absenteeism and achievement for our um, the subgroup that we are identified for um, targeted intervention and support. So I for feel ELL. like that's really good news. Yeah. For EL. Yes. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Principal Wilson. Thank you. And uh, last but certainly not least, um, Northampton High School School Improvement Plan. And we have uh, Ms. Valencourt here to present on behalf of NHS. I knew you saved the best for last, so thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, putting together the SIP was actually a really enjoyable um, experience for me. It gave me an opportunity to meet. Um, some of the stakeholders I hadn't met before, some of the parents, and really it gave me a good opportunity to re-engage with our faculty and our teachers in a different way. So this process was um, quite lovely and informative. So we started our first faculty meeting by, or I started our first faculty meeting by asking folks to share something they um, wanted to stop doing, to keep doing, and to start doing. And then I took some of their answers and some of those conversations back to our school council meeting. And from there, we started um, talking about some of these goals and really putting some of those responses from teachers into, um, into statements that are now our goals. So I'll share those with you. So goal one, this was a start doing, and this was a start offering collaborative time. But um, our goal number one is to continue um, and finally, hopefully, complete the curriculum work that has been happening over the last five years, specifically offering um, planned collaborative time for teachers to work, to revise, and to create and to align their curriculum. So we're, we're really close to that happening. So um, the related initiatives here are designing common rubrics to discuss the role of homework and to discuss equitable grading practices. And this work is never done. I don't imagine that there's a period at the end of these five years and we will stop doing this work, but hopefully it will be published and now we can just revise and reflect for years to come. Uh, the second goal is to develop academic, social, and extracurricular opportunities and programs that support the needs of all students and their post-secondary plans. So this was, um, a, in our conversation, this was something that we needed to continue doing, which was to support all students. And um, you will see under, the, under goal two, the initiatives are to begin and develop the Twilight Learning Center um, to be able to offer a new range of services for and course opportunities for special education students, um, co-taught classes and learning labs, these are new at Northampton High School, to use my career and academic plan, which is my cap, to support each student in developing a, a secondary, uh, post-secondary plan, and to continue and to finalize the work around scheduling for HAMP 35, which is our flex block, to explore additional innovative pathways, and um, the last one is to engage staff and administrators 
with the needs and opportunities fund and community resource group which is we're gonna have to change that name because the acronym is not and <laughs> it's just not working for me so I'll, I'll work on that but um, so the Needs and Opportunities Fund and Community Resource Group is um, a group that the Student Council has put together to um, support students with not only getting some um, uh, materials or goods or items that will help them just have a more secure and happy life, but you know, to be able to integrate into our community. So a gym membership or finding a job or a mentor or even a bus pass or getting a book to, for a college or dual enrollment class that they may not have had access to previously. Goal number three, um, and this one was a keep, let's keep on working towards uh, closing the achievement gap. So um, to in increase our subgroup enrollment in uh, dual, dual enrollment in Smith College's at advanced placement classes. And to do that, we would like to increase the number of advanced courses that we are offering and to um, be able to provide new teachers who are coming into our school system or our school with opportunities to become, um, to take AP courses and to do some pre professional development around teaching AP classes. And we are um, looking, the school council has, I'm, it just, it, so exciting to me that they um, are thinking about and really looking forward to creating a core group, a focus group of students who have not participated in a Smith class before or dual enrollment and working with those students to help with the process of um, being a college student and getting enrolled and um, finding professors who are a good fit and maybe making them a small cohort to, to um, work with throughout the year. So um, the last goal, and again this one, um, came from a please, can we start having some leadership opportunities? Can we start honoring teacher voice? And can we please start valuing that teachers are knowledge base? And um, of course, how do you say no to that when teachers are asking for those things? So our fourth goal is to strengthen our school and local community by fostering confidence, hope, enthusiasm among the staff and faculty. This goal is a goal where teachers can work together to, um, to showcase their work, to do learning walks. Um, we are putting together an academic integrity council which feels very important to teachers in regards to um, academic integrity and making decisions around cases of cheating. Um, we're also looking at attendance or an attendance committee. How are we making waivers and who are we making them for? How can teachers be a part of those decision making and students and families? Um, the last, and then also to, um, to build a collegial and welcome working space for teachers what, and students and families, whether that's lunch meetings or, you know, um, having more celebrations or building based activities, whatever it takes to foster some good relationships and school spirit. Uh, we are committed to the professional growth of our, of our staff and our faculty um, and we think that can happen through celebration and just feeling good about being at work. So those are our goals. Um, you know, these goals we hope to be able to use as we evaluate ourselves and our growth throughout the year, whether that's with me or another principal that is hired, I feel like this work is really important and can be followed, um, you know, just about by anybody in our school council is very dedicated for this work. So I think it can be something we follow through with. Any questions? Do we have any questions about, yes, Ms. Hennessy. A clarifying question and then a, a real question. Um, under goal two, mm -hmm. Um, under related initiatives. Yes. Fourth bullet, develop and pilot a team of students. Do you and, see that? Mm -hmm. um, I'm just, I, I don't know what that means. Is it sure. to develop a team of students and teachers to study design and pilot scheduling? Or I didn't understand the pilot aspect in that. Sentence. So, thank you. So, we have surveyed students about what they might want in um, some alternative scheduling. We have also surveyed teachers about what they might want or might be helpful in alternative scheduling. The alternative scheduling being that flex block, which is a 25 minute period in the middle of the day. Um, and 
students, I think it's important to have student voice and teacher voice. Yeah. So when I say pilot, this is a team that's going to work together with some student presence and teacher presence. Okay. And then my, my question question, although that was a question, <laughs> is under goal three, mm -hmm. um, increased subgroup enrollment, uh, right? Um, I'm wondering under the one, two, three, fourth bullet, determine a task force data team to track and analyze data regarding accessibility and participation in AP courses. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if one of those little bullets underneath that could be to um, look at the scheduling. Um, because I, I get the HAMP 35 is a flex schedule, but uh, for me, um, the question of the overall schedule um, is important. But I'm not adding, asking you to add. I'm just wondering if that's something you were thinking of being a part of that task force. So since I've been working at Northampton High School, we've, stud we've looked at the schedule each year, and it is always a part of our mm -hmm. questioning. And yes, I think continuing to look at the schedule and how it supports accelerated classes and all students is definitely important work and we'll continue to study the schedule and okay. see the feedback. All right, thanks. Ms. Voss. I think Ms. Hennessy was reading my mind. <laughs> I just had a, a, another comment really along the same lines and thank you, this was very interesting and clearly a lot of work, you and your team and the rest of the school council. Um, in terms of the HAMP 35 block, I was just going to encourage you also to consider, and it connects with the Smith classes. Um, this year, Smith has a completely new time block. And as we look toward next year, if we want to encourage students to be able to take advantage of the Smith classes, thinking across the, the I'm not used to the new name yet, but the HAMP 35 block, the potential that I believe in November we had agreed that we'd revisit the start time for the high school. So combined with those two changes and the new schedule at Smith, I think getting the students to weigh in and the teachers to weigh in on what makes sense for that HAMP 35 block to enable um, as much choice as possible. And um, it, it feels, m my experience with that, um, is that students are often most able to take a Smith class during the third period when they have their lunch because it gives them time to get over and get back. And I know there's other times they can fit it in, but maybe with this HAMP 35 block, there's opportunity to make even more classes accessible and give them more choice if it's done in a thoughtful way, if, if that's a goal. And then um, I love love, love your idea where I'll just read what you wrote. Identify a group of students to participate in a Smith course and to do a mini lesson on setting up starting process of taking a Smith class. Um, I got the impression that's a group. And I just wanted to share some terminology. It's, so at Smith we have um, posse students and posse is a national organization. And um, ours come from the same geographical area, but it's, it's nationwide. And the idea is a lot of times if you go away for college, you're not comfortable being away from your friends. And if we recruit a group that has spent a year or two together and they come together, it gives them the support they need. And so I just offer you that model. It, it's really what you're saying, but it's a name for it. And I think it's been shown that it works really well. So if you had some mentoring and a group of students that traveled together to, as you said, uh, um, you know, a well thought out class. That could be a really great experience. And I invite you to be a part of that. I would love to um, participate in that. Just great. email me and I, I know the place well and I think I could help. Great, yes, thank you. Ms. Fallon. Um, so I, have, I don't even know how to phrase the question. Um, I guess my question has to do with how the theory of action related to your last goal, goal four, and ownership in school-based initiatives, and the first goal of creating common rubrics, how they're intersecting. Like, how are the, like, this seems really ambitious to me to have, to find enough time for teachers to come together and agree on summative assessments um, in multiple areas. and. I mean, at the university level, like, that's what you did. The department chair said, you will all get this chapter test, and it was like a done deal, and it was actually really easy, and, and it made sense, and in a big university setting, that worked for us, but I'm imagining it's a lot harder for some teachers who want to do it their way, and they, love, they want their independence and creativity, and so I feel like that process could take a long time. Right. Um, and so I'm wondering what the timeline is, 
what the buy-in is, how well that, where this is coming from. I know that from the district improvement plan, we talked about the importance of vertical and horizontal alignment. So I know that's partly where it's coming from, but I'm just wondering how this rollout is going and how well it's being received and how much support you. So I think it's important to recognize that it needs to be a slow process, at least this piece with um, summative assessments. And we, at the beginning of the year, with the teachers, we set a professional goal of, come, of finalizing two summative assessments um, for any two units for semester one and semester two. So I feel like two summative assessments is really a good place to start. And I think the buy-in comes from being able to use those um, summative assessments and being able to look at how much um, having a common rubric and how to look at student work and have conversations about student work. Um, if, if teachers and staff become a part of this process in the study of the common assessment and the student work, I think then I imagine that it will it will grow some some excitement about how to um, reflect on your teaching practice, how to move kids forward, what questions are working, what questions are not working. Um, I I hope that the experience, the full experience of that, can can help the staff have some buy-in. And I think two summative assessments is reasonable to be able to complete and try some of that work. Um, the time, of course, is always challenging, but I am very dedicated at this point to making sure that all of the collaboration time that we have is time that is spent, is invested in this particular work. So faculty meetings already have started very focused on learning and thinking and doing this work together. And the, our department chair meetings, same thing. So they are all um, times to do work that are potentially led by one person, but then they come to their department meetings and then they're doing a lot of that work together. So creating real um, time to do that work is important and we have to model that. You know, I, I'm invested in modeling that collaborative time and work with the kid, you know. And as you hire new people into the, like, into the district, will there be an opportunity for them then to give input or is like this going to be, are there always going to be like, welcome to the district, this is the summative assessment we use in English? No, not at all, but I am finding that the folks who we have hired um, from outside the district or even outside the state who are coming in now have no, they are not the folks who are questioning this type of work. They're expecting that this work exists. They are asking where it lives and they are looking at that information. They've done it. Other districts are doing this. Most states are doing this. You know, Northampton, we're getting there slowly, but um, it's not new to people. But the real question is, you know, what if they have another idea that works for them? And so the idea is that you're always looking at student work. You're always looking at your assessments. They're forever changing, and you're, they're growing, and they're becoming better, and they're more um, reflective of the teacher and their art and their creativity. So they're meant to change, but to change collaboratively, to change with their partners, to change with um, their colleagues. You know, everyone has a voice in that change. Students change, interests change, they have to continue, you know, the question, everything, to, yes, they will change. <laughs> Thank you so much. Mr. Kaufman. Thank you. Um, thanks for bringing out the uh, assessment piece, Laura. I mean, I, when, I think that was one of the three standards that the district review team looked, uh, the state yes. district review team looked at last year, and unfortunately we're still waiting for that report, but I think that might also provide some healthy feedback from an outside perspective. Uh, on our strengths and weaknesses in that area, K-12, so. Um, I wanted to ask you about goal three, which is increasing subgroup enrollment. Um, and again, I'll, I just, I don't really mean to put you on the spot, but I'm looking at some data here that shows pretty significant decreases from last year to this year in the numbers of kids that are participating in advanced courses across all of our subgroups. So was that purposeful? Was that and can you explain why that happened last year and whether your goal to increase that this year is a new philosophy, a new approach, or is it just a glitch in the data? Is the data not accurate? Can you help me under understand that better? I, yes, I, well, I can't because I need to understand it better. Okay. And I'm well, having those <laughs> conversations, but it's, it's um, you know, the data is clear. We are declining in subgroups, specifically uh, economically disadvantaged students and um, 
students with disabilities. Really, we've declined in every area, including all students. So the data is the data. And I don't, we are, this just this week um, to this afternoon, I printed off all of the students who have never taken an advanced placement class, mm -hmm. and there are like 90 students on the list right. of all 11th and 12th graders. That's not a huge number. So I need to do some more work around who these students are and how come they're not participating? Do we have enough classes? What are the barriers? That really <laughs> drives the goal is, um, is trying to understand the data and right. just you know to interview students and teachers all of that thank you i appreciate that yeah mm -hmm. so the same question regarding chronic absenteeism the uh, same concern that i that i raised with leslie but we just have significant numbers of kids missing school and the data from last year to this year is considerably worse so um we're we're hiring somebody are there other efforts you feel like the things that you put into the sip are going to improve there is there anything else that we can do to support you it's just it's think, so alarming. That's I appreciate that, and yeah. I know that there are two existing things right now. I know that our code of conduct team, which is a district-wide yep. initiative, they are working to look at attendance, um, and that you know stakeholders include teachers, parents, students, administrators. So I think some of this work will come from there. But on a school-based level, teachers are concerned. Um, administration is concerned, and this is where we talk about the attendance committee and being able to really understand what's happening with students and why they are missing and who the students are that are missing and um, getting more information there. Mm -hmm. Again, it's really looking into the data, having our yeah. instructional leaders get it. But right. it's serious, yes. Like you too. <laughs> Can you share any optimism? <laughs> Do I have optimism? Yeah, I mean, you, you guys are talking about it. You have a committee looking at it. We have some new supports coming your way. I mean, you, you feel like I this. Have so the risk of being too idealistic. <laughs> Um, you know, I really think the morale of the school is reflected by our teachers, and this is why I have this, this last goal, right? So um, to develop, um, to create instructional leadership and strategies uh, to strengthen local community and confidence and hope and all of this, right? So I feel like when yeah. our, our teachers want to be there and they're excited to be there, the, the environment changes, students then want to be here, there, mm -hmm. right? So it's, it's balancing all of that. I can't do that alone, but I can help create and listen to teacher voice and provide opportunities for them to take on leadership roles. Yeah. My hope, my optimism is, if we can create an environment that's warm, we build good relationships that the students will come and they will stay and they'll right. not want to leave. Thank you, and I, I say the same thing to all the principals. I recognize fully that this is not a school-specific issue. This is a community issue, family issue. There are things that are way outside your control, but since we're talking about school improvement plans, I just want to make sure that yes. you're cognizant of the difficulties that we're facing and some of the unfortunate moves in the wrong direction over the last two years, but I'm um, very happy with that strategies and the, and the thoughts that, you've, that you're putting into this. So, thank you. I was just going to sort of follow up with the, I mean, it's interesting to look at the high school and the middle school and that these are times where young people are really defining themselves and really trying to find themselves and they also have a great deal of independence. And I think that it looks to me from both of these school improvement plans um, that we are also um, looking at a whole child that is um, and thinking about them and their goals and longings and hopes and dreams and that they don't all fit into um, one category and I think that both JFK and the high school are looking at ways to um, to meet those kids who have you know who might not want to take an AP class. I mean, I have a kid that doesn't want to take an AP class, so I can give you some data. Um, I do too. You know, because she wants to do other stuff, because she's yes. passionate yeah. about other stuff. And um, I think the more that we can hook the kids on what they're passionate about instead of uh, saying this is what school is, and I think that engaging the teachers in their passion is such a beautiful way of doing that also because every teacher is a creative human being that's bringing, the, I mean, they just carry around a basket of passion and creativity. So the more we can 
be working I on appreciate all that, of that you can recognize. Just, but I, it's really here. I really see it. So thank you. And I want to point out too that in goal two, bullet three, the MICAP supporting each student with developing a post secondary mm -hmm. plan, it yeah. intentionally doesn't say a college plan. That's right. No. I love that. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah. Ms. Fallon. Yeah, I just wanted to ask under goal three with the related initiatives, when you say to increase the number of advanced courses offered, do you, is that data that you keep, like, I don't know, our AP class is capped? I know I saw the AP physics class had 30 students in it. That's right. Uh, so do you keep track of the number of students that would have enrolled had there been space that we're turning away so that you know that there's a demand for it and that's why you want to increase it? So this, the class is capped around, it should be clapped, capped at 30, but our teachers are quite generous, so they're like, okay, one more. And then they'll say, okay, yes, one more, you know, and then you get a class of 32. Um, but the priority is 12th grade students, and so if those 11th graders are unable to get the AP course, then yes, they are become the priority for the next year. But because the classes, it's AP physics, um, the AP calculus courses, those classes are are bursting at the seams and I think it speaks highly to students wanting to engage in both science and math but also that we have these very energetic and, and amazing teachers who are teaching the curriculum within those courses and they they draw students in um, so yes we need more and we need to open that opportunity to a wider range of students who want to take it but they just can't get in it yet yet and so you have those yes I have the data okay. it's there counselors keep it yes Mm -hmm. So you would know which subjects are the ones that you need to add. Right. Okay. Definitely. Thanks. Mr. Kaufman made me realize I had another question in, in his conversation. Sorry. But um, I'm curious if you would be willing to make any comments to us about how you might Anything you could share when we talk about the start time for the high school in the coming months and whether or not you think that might affect the attendance and I'll just put out there, we've had conversations about mechanisms to delay it by 30 minutes. Um, do you see that? How do you, how do you see that? I'm sure it affects lots of things but it really came to mind in terms of attendance. So I know last year at the very like two days left of school I had a frantic group of students who came into the office and they were a wreck <coughs> here the school time is changing it's going to be later no one asked us what we think of that how come no one is talking to us and they were frantically reporting that how is this going to impact my job I'm gonna have to change my schedule how is this going to impact my sports we're going to be a school that gets to all the sports games late so things like this so what I have to share is um, I think the conversation is important. I know it's important to our community, but can we please remember to include the young people in that conversation, yes. no matter what shape it, you know, no matter how it unfolds. Um, I can't, I don't know how it will impact attendance, but I think it would be good to look at local schools and to compare that and to see what data says for other um, schools that are practicing or have later start times. Well, since I have you there, how would you best involve the students in that conversation, if you don't mind? <laughs> well, I would start with our student union, and um, but they are not the voice of every student. They are, they don't really represent um, the diversity of our full school body. So I would, um, you know, I would. I would consider who you want to be representing that group and I would look to make sure that we had all parts of our school represented, whether it was those at the top of the class and the middle, you know, from all different uh, demographics. I think it's important just to make sure we have representation. I think teachers can identify who those people are. Some of our lead, uh, administrative team could identify that. We can ask and seek volunteers. I'll just, sorry, I, I'll just um, say we, when we talked about this, it was either April or May, I think we were going to go back to the school council and ask them to come back. And so it may be, I, you know, I just want to mm -hmm. put it out there that I, for one, would like to hear more and get as many voices and responses as possible. Um, and I know this affects everybody in some ways. And then going back to the attendance, um, I'm also curious to know if there's a, effect of say the percentage of kids we have with 
various disabilities, trauma, special needs, and in some of those categories, Northampton is higher than some. I don't know if we're above average. I think in some of them we are above average. And does that affect the attendance as well? I'm not sure if I'm following your question. Um, are you it, saying that students who have excused absences or I guess I'm just saying if we have unexcused if we have um, attendance problems mm -hmm. um, and it sounds like there's some data that suggests it's gotten a little worse mm -hmm. that's just come out and I haven't it's seen like that yet um, I was just wondering if it's related to other things that are special about our district but maybe that's a different conversation okay I think it might be um, I think that most districts are experiencing the same thing. The same I mean, every thing. time you open up the newspaper or a professional article, it's about students with anxiety, right? We've read it, these are the headlines. And so really, I think it is a nationwide problem. I don't think it's special okay. to Northampton, but I think we are in a position to be able to think deeply about it and, and be active in making our changes. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank, thank you, you Ms. Valencourt. Thank you. So, and again, thank you to all of our principals and all of our uh, school councils and s faculty who uh, participated, and community members who participated in the development of these school improvement plans. Um, in terms of future business and meeting dates, we have our next uh, school committee meeting, regular school committee meeting on October 10th um, and October 20th. In the month of October at 6:45 here in the JFK Community Room, and then November 14th, um, also here at the JFK Community Room at 6:45. So I have a question. Okay. Was one of the meetings in October supposed to be a student meeting? October 10th. So is that 6:15? Yes. So okay. I just wanted. To yes. So I think. That Thank you. Yes. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay, we've had a motion made and seconded to adjourn the meeting. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? So the Thursday, September 26, 2019 meeting of the North School Committee is adjourned. Mm -hmm.